Could you tell us a little bit about um, about your carpal tunnel symptoms when they started and so on? Yeah, they started in, in terms of sensation. I would say that they started easily five or six years ago, um, and it would bother me for a period of there'd be a couple of weeks where I'd be waking up with uh, numbness in these fingers and shaking them out. That, that kind of jazz, typically associated with uh, the start of kite skiing season. So I'd be working all day and then. Um, doing that on the weekends, and so it would just be, mm. yeah, overload. What is kite skiing? Kite skiing. <laughs> kite skiing yeah. is um, using a four, typically a four-line kite, um, to pull you on skis across the the snow. Wow. And uh, the actually the equipment has changed significantly over the last few years, so it's actually a, a lot less pressure on the hands. But when you're learning and uh, the older equipment, there was a lot of strain. There's a lot of this oh. kind of movement on handles. Now they're on bars, and you can just steered with two fingers, so it's very different now. But um, so typically, I just manage it with Advil and uh, like a drugstore splint, wear that for a couple of weeks, and, and it would settle down. So you know, on and off over over the years, but nothing nothing concerning, and nothing that I needed to you know, mm -hmm. treat further. Um, and then last fall, so the fall of '07, I started to get um, weakness and pain. When I was when I was working, so I'd come home and I just feel, yeah. I mean, when when I'd be working on somebody, uh, particularly working on the neck, so when you're supporting um, the head, that kind of thing, I start to feel um, a bit of a burning sensation in through here, and that would start to carry on um, when I was at home as as well. At night, I started to touch tape Advil on a much more regular basis, and the split before I mean, we're in the split to taking Advil for a little bit, managed it, um, but that stopped working. And so I was just getting more and more pain. And that was after um, I've actually reduced the amount I, I've worked. So it's not like it, it's associated with an increase in workload at all. It's in fact the opposite. Um, as of last July, I'd actually cut back on the amount that I was working. So yeah, so it's getting, I'm working less and it got worse, so. Yeah, so how many treatment hours would you be working then? Now? Mm -hmm. um, 30. 25 to 30, wow. yeah. And that slowed down. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I did. I mean, I've been massage therapist for 17 years. And um, typically a week, yeah, and a week is longer than than many, I suppose. I would typically do about 30 in, in a week, 30. But I also get massage therapy treatment. I would say on average, but every other week, if not more. Um, and I also take a lot of time off, like I typically take three months off a year. Let's, let's just do this, um, this self-testing, so yeah, extend and then bring your hands down a bit so you really put some pressure on the wrist. Mm-hmm, don't like it. Uh -huh. Hurts um, here, all the way into here, like a, I, mean, I can describe it as a nerve pull, that kind of nasty, nervy. Okay. Yeah. Is it still bothering you? No. So it quieted down right away? Yeah. Okay, and then let's reverse that, please. Don't like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. Um, <clears throat> this would be more pain. Mm -hmm. um, can you describe the pain in the location, please? Uh, yeah, it's kind of, it's in the wrist here, mm -hmm. and then uh, into into these fingers, but more in I would say more wrist symptoms. Uh, okay. But and it's more pain versus a nerve pull. So this is the beginning of our last treatment together, the fifth treatment at the end of um, a two week cycle, and Jen's going to repeat her Phelan's test and reverse Phelan's test and see how they come up for her. Nothing yet? No. And seven, and eight, and nine, and ten. Keep going. A little bit, a little bit of pressure feeling. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Great. Let's see if we can just... Um, if people don't get symptoms, sometimes you get them to go for like 30, 60 seconds to see if you can provoke the symptoms. So I'm not sure how long we've been at now. Um, so the pressure's building or it's staying static? No, static. same. Okay. And in fact, I'd say that's actually, I would say it's decreasing. Ah, so that's yeah. interesting. That's probably a good thing. Yeah. Okay, and then take yourself out of that position. And how quickly do the symptoms abate? 
Right away. Right away. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, let's do the reverse valence test, please. Molto bene. seconds. Nada. It's nope. wonderful. Let's just hold it for a little bit longer. I'm getting a bit of an ache, but it's on the, um, the extensor. <laughs> You're getting an extensor ache? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's good to fix one thing and then leave something else undone. To, <laughs> yeah. Peel the onion. Keep coming, in, keep coming back. Okay. How's that been? Fine. Yeah. Great. Wonderful. So we've had some really nice therapeutic change in terms of those provocative tests. So we're testing uh, Jennifer's good side in terms of uh, her the upper limb tension tests. So we lift the arm up. Is the upper limb tension test number one, and we depress the shoulder, the first motion barrier, and I'm posting out. Any symptoms? No. Great. If I go to the first significant motion barrier, which is about there. No. No. Great. Okay. So shoulder girdle depression is not provocative at the moment, and we march the upper yeah. arm up. Yep. We want to get to 90, then 110 degrees, but the shoulder girdle depressed. But uh, we're only getting yeah. to about seven or so. Okay, what do you feel at that point? Pull down the arm here. So pulling along the inside of the arm, mm -hmm. and it's gone right away as Correct. soon as we get the pressure off. Okay. We want to challenge uh, Jennifer's uh, nervous system, the bias towards the median nerve, but we want to have the, um, the, um, the challenge distributed evenly along the nerve. So to do that, rather than depressing the shoulder girdle fully, I'm going to let it come up quite a bit. It's depressed a little bit. And I'm going to do that so that I can get up to about 110. Yeah. So at 90. Yeah. Okay. Gone. Gone. Yeah, we're just, sorry. yeah, we're just um, coming very close to symptom production there. So we'll just go shy of that. Everything's quiet? Yeah. Great. Don't let your hand fall. Okay. I'm going to use the fingers and thumb as a lever to extend the wrist. Pull down the forearm, gone. Great, so pulling in the front, front of the forearm and then gone right away. Mm -hmm. I'll go shy of that. Supination, nothing new. Mm -hmm. External rotation, nope. nothing new. And then I'm maintaining all these pre, um, pre positioned components as we extend the elbow. And... Just starting, uh, yes. pulling. Um, on the forearm, mm -hmm. more towards the thumb. Mm -hmm. So you got some pulling in the mm -hmm. forearm on the thumb side, yep. and it goes away right away. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to go into that position again, and then what I'd like you to do is to move your head very slowly, purely in a side flexion. So not rotating, but just side bending purely away. Okay, if I can have that. That and that, and Boy. that's just the edge of it. Mm -hmm. It's gone again. So I'm shy of that. Then the head goes to the side. And see how her neck is available to go a long, long ways. Yeah, now I feel it's all the way back yeah, gone. Mm -hmm. So when you get to that, what sensation do you feel? Like a shot actually down to the thumb. A shot all the way yeah. from here, or just oh, a shot first, yeah. very close? Okay. And it's gone again yeah. as I back off. Okay. So we're here to test the provocative side of uh, Jennifer. So upper limb tension test number one, shoulder girdle depression, first motion barrier, and post down. Anything new? Just a, a little sensation in the upper arm. Mm -hmm. What do you feel? Mm -hmm. uh, it's common, yeah, to feel like this yeah. top of the, the shoulder cap and outside of the arm, and it goes away right away. Yeah. Okay. Depress and anchor. We march up. Ow. Ow. 
Mm -hmm. What do you feel when yeah, it gets pull, to out? Yeah, pull down mm -hmm. through here. So she's got the same pulling sensation here. It actually comes on later in the movement than the other side. And uh, yeah, Jennifer's had a lot of treatment around the rotator cuff and the pecs here. So even though she's still like thicker muscle development wise, from the nervous system's perspective, um, <laughs> she's better than she is on the, um, on the uh, good side. In terms of underneath the pectoralis minor. So uh, let's go up here again, and we're gonna, I'm gonna elevate the shoulder just to the point where, now when I hold it down, we're just, just shy of the Mister, systems? Yeah. Okay, great, I'm gonna let it up a bit, mm -hmm. and there we go, don't let your hand fall, yeah. You gotta extend the wrist, right ah! Right away. <laughs> okay, so as soon as we start extending the wrist, we get symptoms, and what are those symptoms? Pull, right through here. A pulling feeling. And a start of pain. Not horrible, but it's, it, yeah, mm -hmm. it's And has it gone away it. right away, or is it still thrumming it's, through you? No, there's still an awareness there, but that's been the, it's no different than when I, oh, no, that, that was unpleasant. Mm -hmm. I'm just so getting shots, bit... I'm getting shots now in the rest of it. Great. So this is the uh, final upper limb tension test assessment uh, that Jennifer and I are doing during our treatment trial. So shoulder girdle, depression, posting out, abduction. Uh, so you can see she abducts cleanly here. We've just completed doing a whole bunch of uh, work around uh, the top couple ribs and the, and the clavicle as well as the front of the shoulder. So that's helping with that particular movement. So. Uh, shoulder girdle depression, posting out, up we go to 110, and then we extend the wrist. And what's really nice this time, when I extend the wrist, I can't, I'm going right to the end of wrist extension, I'm overpressuring, I'm not feeling anything um, happening with her shoulder girdle. So she's got nice extensibility in the wrist, and she doesn't feel like she needs to offload the nervous system proximally by pulling the shoulder up. So, that's, so I really, I'm really cranking the wrist extension, and there's no symptoms. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Supination, external rotation, to there, and elbow extension. You can see the elbow is almost going straight. Yeah. Actually, it is straight almost. Okay, and then the head to the side. Wonderful. So that's not a great feeling. No, in the okay. thumb. Into the thumb. What you can see is that the system has got a lot more length than it has in the past. And uh, when we're in this position, so we can create sensation in the thumb. I'm going to do this. And what kind of sensation? Uh, pulling and tingling in the thumb and first finger, mostly in the thumb. Okay, pulling and tingling in the first finger and the thumb. Um, and it goes away right away when we release the uh, tension? It takes about a second. takes about a second. So you have some things you wanted to share about your uh, experience? Yeah, uh, well, one of the things I found very interesting and most surprising was the uh, significance of the fluid techniques and the changes uh, that they made. Both the first treatment and the fourth treatment. The first treatment, all we did was fluid techniques and immediately there was an increase in the strength, which I found quite shocking, frankly. So today, I was planning on uh, treating the fluid dynamics inside, the, um, inside Jennifer's wrist, and I think now we need to anyways, because things are getting irritated. So uh, the technique is basically, I interlace my thumb with her thumb here, and so you can see my hand is going to be lining up right across uh, her flexor retinaculum, so I have a nice contact right across her carpal tunnel, and then I interlace my fingers of my other hand this way. My hand contact is very light. I'm just compressing her, her skin and her superficial fascia. So I'm just compressing tissue that's only about a millimeter into her. Um, so I compress that tissue, and then there's a point at which, you know, when I've compressed it very slightly, it starts to resist me. And then I allow the tissue to push my hand away. And so the tissue pushes my hand away, and my hand comes out, and there's a point at which if my hand has to go any further, I'm actually sort of 
I'm not just leaving the surface of her skin, but I'm, I'm not being pushed out by the tissue anymore. So I alternate compressing the tissue and letting it recoil just in this skin and superficial fascial layer. We've been working for about five minutes now with um, Jennifer's wrist. And what's happened is that the uh, fluid flow through the superficial fascia is uh, really proceeding very nicely. As that flow starts to happen, you can feel fluid moving through the superficial parts of your, um, of your client's wrist, then um, it's common to sort of naturally change the, um, the dynamics. So instead of doing a straight compression and recoil to make it gross and move my hands largely, um, I'll compress distally and then I'll roll that compression in a proximal way. So I'm going to start sort of milking in this kind of way. So I'm just doing it in a large way with my hands to show you that um, now I'm doing it in a, in a real time <laughs> way with my hands. And you can see my hands are moving quite considerably now. And that's because there's probably two or three millimeters of um, into underneath the skin that the fluid is moving nicely through. So again, I'm not thinking too much about the carpal tunnel yet. I'm just thinking about catching a wave and moving this wave of fluid um, through the wrist. So I'm going to continue this for another five minutes at least. We've been working for about another five minutes, and at this point the fluid is moving really nicely through the wrist and hand, and you can see that I'm doing a bit of a rotary movement. So as I compress with my uh, dorsal side hand, I'm allowing the wrist to extend a little bit. And I'm rolling my force around now as she's flexing. So again, I'm continuing with this pumping with a little bit of rotary movement as well. As we're proceeding in this way, it's become clear to me that, um, that Jen's got really good fluid dynamics. She's, a, she's an athlete and you know, fluid moves well through her body in a general sense. Um, so that's great. But um, there really feels to be a, an area of congestion in the carpal tunnel. <laughs> so everything is moving nicely. <laughs> the back of the uh, wrist, even the carpal bones, the backs of the carpal bones are starting to float like little buoys in the river floating in the summertime. Little Javex bottles, hopefully they were emptied and washed before someone threw them in the river. So our carpal bones are kind of floating and, and, and really um, moving in this delightfully buoyant way, dorsally. But anteriorly, it feels like they're, um, instead of those, uh, those Javex boys being held down by maybe like a little bit of nylon rope onto a little anchor on the bottom, there's this whole um, viscous kind of muck or mud that's, um, that's holding on to the carpal bones anteriorly. It feels like I need to engage things slightly differently. So what I'm going to do is I'm holding on to wrist and on to Jen's wrist lightly, but I'm just now going to drag it up towards the ceiling a little bit to create a little bit of um, distraction in the wrist. It's probably just I don't know. 10-15 grams of distractive force. It's very light. And as I do that, now I can feel that um, all those Javex balls that have been wiggling nicely, they're all connected to each other. And I'm just engaging the matrix of, of fibrous tissue, the, you know, the different interosseous ligaments that hold the uh, carpals together. And we're going back to our rolling type of uh, manipulation. So I'm allowing my thenar eminence to massage inside the carpal tunnel and hydraulically change the pressures there. So I'm not like forcing that fluid out, I'm just compressing it a little bit and still I'm letting it recoil. Yeah, mm -hmm. so uh, yeah, maybe if we can drain those um, compartments, mm -hmm. then you're going to be less, yeah, actually, yeah. Just... 
And then on Wednesday we came in and said, oh, in an ideal world, we wouldn't be treating me today because, you know, we're pressed for time, blah, blah, blah. Um, and again, I did a lot of fluid techniques, and at that time I was having quite a lot of symptoms with pressure, a lot of tenderness, and um, that made a huge difference. I was able to ride for, you know, 50 kilometers afterwards, and uh, very little discomfort. So I think it's really important to emphasize the significance of doing those fluid techniques, because as massage therapists, and myself being one, they're born. They're totally born, and they're not sexy. We like to do, you know, see what we're doing getting in there and doing stuff and making a change well. These very subtle techniques make made a huge difference. So you admit your own prejudice Absolutely. as a therapist against that, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So what do you, when you do it, it makes, yeah, it makes mm. a difference. What would you suggest saying to a client then who feels similarly impatient with, with the process? <sighs> Just that what we need to do is to normalize the fluid in here and to get the this, this swelling out and it's, it takes time and it's going to feel like we're not doing a lot, so just take, you know, relax and do some deep breathing and you'll notice the difference afterward. The proof is in the pudding, basically, right? So this is day two, or treatment two, and uh, I'd really like to focus on the fluid dynamics around the nerve as well as inside the nerve and to uh, release the flexor retina oculum. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, you can see how Shannon's skin is quite mobile here, and then um, when we get to this proximal skin crease, there's a lot less mobility. See, she's sliding or a lot less mobility, so, Don't we, like that. and she doesn't like the feeling. So there's uh, actually a connective tissue retinoculum um, that's quite superficial here. And it runs something like this. So there's congestion underneath this retinoculum and it, and it creates uh, irritating uh, symptoms for her. Um, Then, if I use my thumbnail, sorry. That was a good one. <laughs> that was a sharp one, eh? Yeah. If I use my thumbnail in this way, then I can feel the edge of the flexor retinoculum going over to the pisiform. The hook of the hammy. And then on the side of the scaphoid here, and the ridge of the trapezium. And if I go distal, I can feel the edge of the retinaculum here. So the flexor retinaculum is. Uh, is this area in here. Uh, the median nerve uh, lies between the um, tendon of flexor carpi radialis and palmaris longus. So here's flexor carpi radialis, here's palmaris longus. And so it's running in between those tendons. It's a soft tubular structure that gets uh, increasingly irritated as we get closer. So if I tap here, it's unremarkable. Yep. If we go a little bit more closely. Okay. Now that we've improved the uh, fluid dynamics in the tunnel uh, to a certain extent, you can see how the flexor retinaculum has got a lot of softness and looseness on the ulnar side. Uh, more around the pisiform. Uh, at the hook of the hammy, there's a, a tight retinaculum or element coming across there. And then when we're on the, um, the thumb side, something's different. <laughs> and that's that. Uh, the uh, retinaculum is, is much uh, uh, more, um, more restricted, especially like right in here. 
So um, there's any number of approaches we can take at this point. Uh, now that the fluid is, is easier, we could uh, mobilize the, um, the retinacular attachments on the bone like we did um, in the wrist uh, more proximal. So I'm just circling around uh, the pisiform on the thumb side and just gently almost cutting, very soft cutting of the retinacular attachment there. And then um, if I go from the pisiform to the root of the first finger uh, in a line in this direction, then I'll run into the hook of the handmaid here. And uh, just on the thumb side, there's a nice taut um, connective tissue band coming off there. So, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to use my thumbnail. And it, it feels just too sharp and mechanical for me. So I think I'm going to use the pad of my thumb, and I'm going to bow that retinaculum um, proximally. And I'm just going to let... Hmm. I'm bowing it proximally, nothing much is happening. So I'm going to bow it proximally and I'm going to let it recoil. I'm going to bow and let it recoil. Bow and recoil. Now something's happening. And uh, what's happening is that uh, these fibers are, um, are getting a little bit more hydrated. And that's what I want. So then. When I release them, it's going to be a much less sharp kind of adventure. So let's try that now. Ah! So it's not quite so sharp and mechanical. Um, the first little bit of them, and then there's this material right in here. So the hook of the hammy is right there. And uh, this material is softer now, but then there's a little sharp part right here. So I'm going to do that pressure recoil a few times. There we go. And it's starting to soften. Now it looks like I'm using my thumbnail right now, but really I'm using the, the pad of my thumb and bowing that retinacular tissue. As I do that, I can actually feel it. Um, it's proceeding about like this. So I can actually feel it pulling across to the other side of the retinaculum. So let's follow that tissue mm, towards the thumb side and uh, it's like nice and thread-like here, like three or four bits of thread wrapped together and then <laughs> when we get about a third of the way um, to the thumb side it uh, becomes much more like a, a Spider-Man web kind of situation where we've got those threads but then it goes like <whistles> down into the hand and there's a lot more of it the uh, flexor retinaculum does get about twice as thick when you get into the middle of it as when you're uh, proximal or distal. So we are entering sort of the thickest zone. Are you okay? You getting mm -hmm. some sensation? No. Okay. We haven't gotten to the median nerve yet. But um, let's... Ah. Yeah, that is tough stuff. So I wasn't getting anywhere, just bowing it one way. So I'm going to bow it um, proximally and then bow it distally. It's a pretty tough connective tissue element. It um, could be up to a millimeter and a half or so thick. Yeah. I think it would be important to do some slides of the nerve, so we're going to be doing that now. That's good. What's nice is that um, even though there was all that swelling this morning, the uh, strength of the uh, little abductor pollicis brevis was better. So uh, what we can infer is that uh, neuroconduction has improved with our release of the tunnel, even though there's inflammation, even though there's like swelling inside the tunnel, it's increasing the tunnel pressure, uh, the nerve is still happier. So um, this is really, this is really a good outcome for this stage of the game.